I must say I found the two IEA presentations exceptionally annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I found Lara's presentation annoying. I mean, because it was so... I mean, this is obviously such a brilliant piece of work and so sophisticated and so well worked through and comes, at least as far as energy efficiency is concerned, to the right conclusions. And all my instincts are to say, oh, there must be something wrong with it somewhere. But <laughs> it's annoying because there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it. So... I mean, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, it's almost like why haven't we done this? But yeah, very. It's an exceptional basis for, for progress. Um, the one area where I thought you were wrong was where you were uh, saying what a great model the EU was, and there Yamina is the one that I'm annoyed by because she's exactly right in <laughs> diagnose again in diagnosing the areas where we have a beginning of policy, but we're nowhere near achieving what we need to achieve. So um, I guess this is the role of the IEA to spur the members to a slightly more aggressive and um, ambitious approach, but um, thank you both for that presentation. And also to the other two presentations which I found uh, very interesting. So I'll say a little bit about the implementation work we're now doing, a little bit about what we're now doing on finance, and a bit more about policy development. Um, in terms of answering the question, well, what will the um, high efficiency scenario at the European level actually look like, or what could it look like, or how do we how do we get there? Implementation, as you know, as you know, we now have a decent set of pieces of legislation, and an important part of our work is precisely implementation. We have the Energy Efficiency Directive. We're in the middle of a process with member states to develop seven interpretative notes. So we're not sitting down and waiting. For the member states to transpose in 18 months time. We're already explaining how we read the text and inviting them to say if they read it differently. So we hope that by uh, in the first half of next year we'll be bringing out those, those documents. We also circulate them among stakeholders. And I think that that implementation process draws attention to the fact, I mean this is really difficult, this directive at the EPPD pose many problems for member states. You use the word governance, we've used the word capacity building, you might also think about institution building. So the process of implementation is as much as anything else, and you talked about the NEEPs, which are the first step in that institution building. We're actually asking member states to put in place the governance structures which will enable them to do any of these things. So for example, they have to work out how they're going to monitor Article 7. That means that they need a better method of calculating savings than they have for the NEEPs. They have to put that in place, they have to report it to us, we have to assess it. That is really difficult, really annoying, really petty work, but it's about building an element of the institution, an institution which can monitor itself. So that's a, a big piece of work that we're committing a lot of resources to, but not half as much as the member states are and need to commit resources to. Implementation of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. It's a little bit further down the track. Member states ought to have reported transposition. Only three member states have reported full transposition, and we've launched the infringement process for those that haven't yet done that. But again, proper implementation of the 2010 Energy Performance of Buildings Directive requires member states to put in place an awful lot of pieces of evaluation. Like, if I'm not going to inspe regularly inspect boilers and air conditioning control systems, and I have a different method, I have to show that that achieves the same outcome. How do I show that? And that, to show that, I need to develop institutional capacity, capacity in testing, capacity in, in, in comparing policies. So that, that directive, too, really puts demands on member states, which we're both, of course, our role is partly to enforce it, but it's equally to enable or support or help member states to meet meet those demands that we have somehow brought about in this legislative framework. And then a very critical part, it's already been referred to by Yamina, the critical, the, the core of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive is Energy Performance Certificates for Buildings. And they're now supposed to be uh, controlled, not just uh, issued, but also controlled. If these certificates lose credibility, our whole, well, one half of our policy loses credibility. So. We're thinking about how we can, in the next step after checking that the legislative transposition is done properly, how we can check um, that energy performance certificates on buildings are actually properly reflecting what ought to happen. My idea was mystery shopping, but I was persuaded that mystery buying of houses was not something that our budget 
would stand. So how can we go about finding a way to test whether the certificates that are slapped on the buildings actually reflect the performance of the, of the building? That's a question for next year rather than this year, but it's one that's very much in our mind. And then the third piece of legislation we have, uh, eco-design and energy labelling of products. It's rolling along. We're nearly there with the boilers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really, we're very nearly there. And um, we have networks standby going through the system. We have uh, vacuum cleaners going through the system. We're, we're catching up on the backlog. We've had a speeding up and we will keep that going. The new working plan will come out very soon, so you'll see the next group of products. But it's not just about passing the legislation, important as that is, it's also about enforcement. Here, member states have the responsibility through market surveillance, but again, the other half of the credibility of our policy will be dead if the, the things that are slapped on the fridges that say A double plus are slapped on B class fridges. And you talked about this again, Yamina. And so we need to work with the member states to reinforce that whole implementation. So the nitty gritty on all three pieces of legislation, or well, four because labelling and equally divide are two, there's an enormous amount of nitty gritty, nasty work to be done for us and for the member states. And that, if we have to resource one thing right now, we have to resource that. And we're trying to. But it's not, it's not, e it's not high status work in the Commission compared with making beautiful new laws, if you see what I mean. Um, I hope it's high status in the Member States. We estimate that this, that to get to the 20% will cost 100 billion a year. And in that framework, if we get 17 billion over seven years out of the multi-annual fr financial framework, it's still a drop in the ocean. It's still two and a half billion towards the 100 billion of cost. On the other hand, if we do get that, and the discussions are going in a way which is not completely critical of the idea of ring fencing for energy efficiency and local renewables, then you have, a, you have something to play with. So one of the issues we're thinking about is how can you use that money, or as much of that money as possible, not as grants, but some cleverer way so that small amounts of public money deliver big amounts of, big amounts of private finance from the banks and from individuals' pockets. That's an area where we will have a communication, the result of our consultation exercise on the finance for the renovation of buildings coming relatively soon, but that's just the beginning of a discussion. I think we're not, we don't yet have good answers to that question, but it's very much on our, on our minds at the moment. Um, we're also working with public authorities, national, regional, local level, capacity building around energy perform, uh, uh, energy, um, the other EPC. Um, Energy, energy performance contracting. Um, so uh, we want to um, show at the national level examples of energy performance contracting that has actually worked and that has managed to get investments off balance sheet for the public sector in particular. And uh, see how, one of the questions for us is how can we build capacity to uh, in the public sector to do what Laura was arguing for, which is to develop the more sophisticated financial mechanisms. So that's a second, that if, you, if you think about where our resources are devoted right now, they're on nitty gritty implementation and, and trying from a very low starting point to get a bit more sophisticated about finance and about how we can, how we can, how we can um, deploy the multi-annual financial framework forward in a way which will attack, use that public money to attack the market failures as effectively as possible. So those are two things which are taking up our mind. But at the same time as we, as we move into the implementation stage of that policy cycle, we're starting the development stage of the next policy cycle. Um, next year, the Commission will come out with a communication on energy and climate policy for 2030. Um, in June 2014, we have to report on whether we're on track for the 20% objective for the Energy Efficiency Directive. And at the end of 2014, we have to review the Energy Labelling Directive, and we put back, we decided not to make changes in eco-design in 2012, but to put that back if we need to change it, so that it will also be at the end of 2014. So we have three very related policy processes that are going on. 
Um, and we need to develop four types of new thing, I think, in order to take, in order to go into the next stage of that implementation process, on top of what is a reasonable but by no means perfect set of policies that we have already. The first one is new analytical tools. The second one is new aims, a new vision. Third one is new policy instruments. And the fourth one is new implementation techniques. And, and those are areas where I hope that, that, that this community, the, the community around ECEEE and the wider community, will help us to think over the next um, 12, 18 months. On new analytical tools, first of all, we don't know how to evaluate the impact of our policies. No more than you do. I mean, you're saying we've got all this beautiful qualitative stuff. What about the numbers? Where are the numbers that we can put? We haven't got any numbers either. And um, how do you ask what is the way to develop eco-design and energy labelling? We have to develop a tool that lets us know what impact our light bulb regulation has had. Mm. And that tool is not sitting there on the shelf. So. Um, let alone, and the light bulb regulation is relatively simple in, in terms of an isolatable effect on the market compared with the buildings legislation or the energy efficiency directive. But we need to get better. The Commission as a whole needs to get better, but we in our world need to get better at retrospective evaluation. There have been some very good papers in the ECEEE summer study on that, and I hope that that will be a strand that continues to be developed. We need to get better at modelling the future. Um, this is an incredibly, unbelievably impressive modelling exercise, but I still bet that you don't model product markets um, in a way that my product colleagues would recognise as describing the products that they're responsible for legislating for. We looked into primes, and which is similar, and they assume that all lighting systems are already operating at a level that is a third below, that is, t that is a third of the good practice that the industry is says, it says it's achieving. So in primes, there isn't much ability to save more on lighting because the assumption about the lighting energy consumption is already very low. That's not, a, I mean, it's necessarily so. I mean, these, you know, when you're working with such aggregated approaches, but if we want to be able to actually say and make the case for strengthening this policy, this suite of policies, we have to do impact assessments. And in the impact assessments, we have to say, if you do strengthen it, this is what it, what it will deliver. What our policy will deliver is a faster take-up of better light bulbs. So we need a modelling process which allows you to assess how effective different policies are at bringing into the market better light bulbs. Bang, 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 bang. And we're not there yet. So that's for, for analytical tools. The second area was new visions or new aims. Partly that's about transport, and partly that's about buildings, or at least those were the two that I wanted to mention. Transport, we haven't really brought into our energy efficiency um, policies um, because, um, well, we just haven't. And we need to, apart from tyres, we do have a regulation on tyres which is just coming into force, which will gather important energy savings. But, um, uh, and it was interesting to hear what progress the US is making in that sector. Of course, the EU is making progress through the CO2 and cars legislation. Um, but Fatih Birol was saying yesterday that trucks is an area which is much less looked at than, than, than the car sector. So we need to ask ourselves questions about whether we can ensure that efficiency for the transport progresses at, at a rate which allows it to deliver some contribution here. I suspect that means that we need to start talking about policies like urban sprawl or, or responses to urban sprawl where the real potential to reduce growing demand for transporters or reduced demand for transporters and I don't know how, they, how the heck you incorporate that into this policy suite but we must develop a vision on the transport side. On the building side it's about um, or one of, the, one of the things we're finding is that our products policy, you said it was only about products but it's beginning to move up into systems so there will be an installer label as part of the heating legislation. And our buildings policy is starting to move down into systems. So the, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive now requires member states to look at building systems and not just at standards for the building as a whole. I mean, yeah, how do we, how do we fit those things together? How do we define, how do we express the way in which we see buildings go forward? Is it an expression which gives up on 
the or which says we've done most of what we can do with the hard kit and it's about whether the kit is on or off at the right times mm. or so we need to we need to think think through further we also need to think through um, in the long run 2050 when we will have decarbonized the building sector because we must or our children will fry then will we have done that through making all the buildings passive taking into account the fact that in Europe 70% of those buildings that we will have decarbonized are the ones which stand today or will they be using a lot of piped in energy which is zero carbon and if so how much of that will be district heating and how much of that will be doing things through electricity that we now do often through gas which is the way in which we're going to and the, because if district heating is not part of the answer that has implications for how we spend money and how we develop policy and if district heating is part of the answer that has different implications um, similarly on, um, on, on things like heat pumps which I think are a critical technology but you might argue they're not because we're going to decarbonise we're going to have insulation that works so getting a, a vision about how we're going to decarbonise the building stock is really important and the third area there would be technologies um, I think it would be helpful if on the efficiency side we were clear which technologies we, we need to see develop I mean if there was an insulation that you could paint on the wall for example that would be wonderful um, if um, 3D printing allows you to halve the weight of products you probably know more about this than I do then you can halve the energy that you need to carry them through the factory what is the how can we hold out the visions that are similar to the visions that have been developed in the in the renewable sector as well as many other sectors electric cars are I mean what is the electric car of the future that's actually going to look like which, which yeah so we need a technology vision to go with even though most of our stuff can be done with existing technologies we do we need to engage more with the research people about what are our technology objectives, I feel. That was new visions and new policy instruments. I've nearly finished. Um, there's the targets debate is going to come back again in June 2014. And at least we're now doing a real-time experiment in whether binding measures are a better solution than binding targets. Um, and I think the binding targets people, and I'm an agnostic, but, I'm an, I'm, I'm, but the binding targets people... Um, also need to think about whether they are binding targets and get rid of the binding measures, people. <laughs> um, but that, because that debate will be coming in, in June 2014, for sure. Um, and th this is linked to what I was saying at the beginning about institutional transformation. I mean, the, the question really is, are binding targets... Can we make the case that we need binding targets because they will force institutional transformation that in, a way that, in a way that all our bits and pieces about green public procurement and so on will not? I, I, and I'm, I'm, but the debate needs to be framed in those sorts of ways. Second question around buildings. How are we going to move? Um, how are we going to force the retrofit of existing buildings to a high standard? Because we have to. And we have no tool. Um, the best tool is probably that that gets translated into an increase in value of the building. So we have a study that we're just launching that is going to try and track how far that's already happening. Are there ways that we can increase the chance that that will happen? Um, or, I mean, I just a couple of years ago I bought, bought a house here. Um, there were, uh, the poor person who sold it um, had to prove that the garden wasn't polluted or he wasn't allowed to sell it, or if he did sell it, he had to put 100,000 euros in an escrow account so that um, if it turned out that it was polluted, the money would be sitting there to get rid of the soil pollution. I mean, are we going down that road for our buildings, policies? Um, are we going down the road? We've got the 3% target for central government. Are we somehow going down the road of expanding that? How are we going to, to make that happen? I don't, I, we have to think about that. Finance, I've mentioned that already. We haven't yet found the key to, to spending the money we've got, although I think we're asking the right questions. And then how do we... How do we the internal energy market communication that was adopted last week has an annex with actions, and one of the actions is to work out how we 
need the electricity market to develop for energy efficiency, which is an action without any um, answers so far, but that's a good question. And that's both an energy efficiency obligations question, which is about obligations on utilities, and a question for about demand response. It's very importantly a demand response question. So how are we going to, what is it, what are the instruments that we can use there, and what kind of pricing do we want to see in the electricity sector? What is, the electricity se sector is clearly still not properly competitive. If it was properly competitive, what would pricing look like? And is that the pricing that we need for energy efficiency? I mean, and if not, well, then those, there are policy implications to different answers to those, to those questions. Finally, finally, on new implementation techniques, two questions. First of all, that absolutely, the key actors in this are member states. And how, I mean, come back to how can we, how, do we need to have a strategy for capacity building or for partnership with them? And you can see from the way we're working on the implementation of the Energy Efficiency Directive, plus through the concerted action, we're very keen to find more ways to work with them. But how can we really build, build across the whole policy area the kind of working that does happen around the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive where there is a real sense of partnership going forward? How are we going to get to that outcome? And secondly, should we be devoting some of our resources to international work? I mean, extra EU work. I suspect not. I suspect the right thing to do is get our stuff right and evaluate it properly or encourage other people to evaluate it properly and then and then let other people, let other jurisdictions decide if this is a useful um, example for them. But there is a question whether we should be engaging more, whether, whether, whether I mean, there's Yatsek over there and Mark Ringel here, whether they should be spending more of their time going on mission to India to describe what they do, or at the cost of them, well, you could work on the plane, Mark, but, so, <laughs> but in, in principle, at least at the cost of actually advancing the modelling and the, the 2030 work that they're supposed to be doing here. And I'm not sure what the, what the answer to that is. I'll stop there.